Let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you for our time together. We do worship you, Lord. You are holy and high and lifted up and far beyond us, Lord. Uh, your ways are higher than our ways and your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We're in good hands when we listen to you and all our ways acknowledge you and allow you to direct our paths, Lord. Open our hearts this evening to your word and your word to our hearts that we might serve you in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to be, strangely enough, in the book of Jonah. Jonah. This is a brief little book, and it's a wonderful little book. And um, around here, when, uh, when you get through a Hebrew, it's one of the best books to tackle on your own because of the simplicity of the vocabulary, etc. Jonah's going to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is a word for Ishtar, if you've heard the name Ishtar. Okay? And it was pretty much the capital of the Gentile world, world at, at this time. There are two things that are going to stand out in this book, and you, you, you can't miss them. It's all about big things or great things, okay? Nineveh is a great city. We've got a great star, and we, uh, we have great repentance, uh, etc. okay? It's also the only book in the Bible where everybody mentioned repents. Everybody in this book is going to repent, okay? Nineveh is going to repent. Jonah is going to repent. The sailors on the ship are going to repent. And you know who else is going to repent? God is going to repent, Okay? The repent, word for repentance means shuv. It means to turn around, to, you know, reverse what you're doing. Okay, so Jonah reverses what he's doing. The sailors reverse what they're doing. Nineveh reverses what they're doing. And God reverses what he's doing. Okay, just that simple. So it is a book about great things, and it is a book about reversing things. Okay, also, um, this is important. Jonah, every time you see the word dove in the Bible in the Old Testament, it is the word Jonah. Okay. And the word literally means the affections and the like the cooing that a, that a dove will make, that that little bit of affection. And Jonah does not want to go to Nineveh. I think he's, he doesn't want to go to Nineveh because of his name, because he's going to pronounce judgment upon them forty days, and you guys are dead because you're so evil. And then when they repented, Jonah just throws a fit and said, "I knew it! I knew it! I knew it!" Well, how do you know it? Well, God sent a prophet there whose name is offering them kindness in the midst of their judgment and mercy. And I think that's what it is. Okay. And you'll notice that Jonah has more success in his rebellion than most of us ever have on purpose. Okay. He just flat out didn't. He wanted them dead. None of his borders are expanding over towards Israel. They're going to be taking part of, uh, part of their land. And he doesn't want any part of it. Uh, and they are an evil, evil people, but they are going to repent. Okay. Strangely enough, Israel, God couldn't get them to repent, but he can get pagans to uh, to repent. Okay, so, and also Nineveh, um, when they do repent, they do some things that look strange to us, but we'll see, and it's been done in history before. Okay, chapter 1, verse 1. The word of Yahweh, the one who was and is and is to come, came to Jonah the dove the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, Mishtar, that great city. There's your first mention of the great. This is a great city. And cry against it, because the wickedness has come before me, before my face. Okay. Remember, same thing happened with Sodom and Gomorrah, to see if their cry before my face is as bad as it's sounding, and it, and it was. And Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish. Do you remember where Saul, the apostle, or the apostle Paul's from? He's from Tarshish, right? Now, I want you to notice something. In the land of Israel, it borders the Mediterranean. Nineveh is inland. And what's he do? He gets a ship. Where's he going? The exact opposite way. Okay, as far away from Nineveh as he can get. Okay, so what's the first thing we know about Jonah? He's a rebel prophet. He's a prophet nonetheless, but he's a rebel. Okay. He, rises, he flees to Tarshish. From the face of Yahweh. He's trying to get as far away from Yahweh as he can. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it okay, with them to Tarshish from the presence or the face of Yahweh. And Yahweh hurled a great wind. Now, hurl, this is like a guy throwing a baseball. God throws a great wind upon the sea, and there was a great storm. Now, notice we've got a great city in verse 1. Now we have a great wind and a great storm. Okay? So that the ship was about to break up. I don't know about you, but I've been out on the ocean, and I have great respect for it. 
It's just a little overwhelming. It's like, this is big. I mean, kind of it's not big in the eyes of God. Nothing's big in the eyes of God, right? But it's big in, I'm not God. I'm, I'm, I'm a little guy. Okay. So God throws a baseball full of, a handful of wind out there. Now, verse 5, so the, so the sailors, these are professional sailors. These aren't rod and reel guys. They became afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and to his lucky charm, lucky rabbit's foot. And they threw their cargo, which was in the ship, into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down below into the hold of the ship, laid down, and he was sleeping. Some guys can sleep through every everything and anything and everything. It's incredible. So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you are sleeping? The Septuagint, when the Greek... What, what, when the Jews translated it in the Greek, the captain goes down there and says, you, how can you be snoring? How is it you're sleeping? Get up. Call on your God, your pagan God, like they have. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Now notice, we're, we're looking for everybody to try, try their God. Maybe one of these gods will work. Kind of thing. Slot machine theology. Each man said to his mate, Come. Let's cast lots that we may learn on whose account this calamity struck us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Now, these lots wouldn't be anything in their paganism, but I think God's controlling the lots here, as he says in the book of Proverbs. You can throw the dice, but God will determine the outcome of how they roll out. Okay? And followed Jonah. They said to him, tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? Okay? What is your occupation? Where you come from, what's your country, and from where are the people that you are, what people are you? He said to them, I'm a Hebrew. Now they were at Joppa, they're in the land of Israel, so they know about the Jewish people, and they know about Yahweh. They know about these things. He said to them, I am a Hebrew, one who has crossed over. That's what that means. I fear Yahweh, who was and is and is to come. Now remember, of all the gods that are out there, Yahweh is literally the God of Israel and Judah. Okay? I fear Yahweh, the God of heaven, who made the sea. And the dry land. Why is he telling them all that extra thing right there? Well, because they need to know it. Then the men became extremely frightened or greatly frightened. And they said to him, how could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of Yahweh because he had told them. Now, you know something? They actually believe him, don't they? They're believing him because when ships are down and you're on a stormy sea and you are convinced you're going to die... I think all of your silliness and nonsense goes away. You're an atheist, and all of a sudden you're, you've heard the expression, there's no atheist in a foxhole on a battlefield. That's not where you find those boys. You find them in the ivory towers of the universities with PhDs. Okay? The men knew what he, had, what he had done. So they said to him, what should we do that the sea may be calm for us? Because the sea it was becoming increasingly stormy. He said to them, you must pick me up and throw me into the sea. What do you think that sounded like to them? <laughs> That's just weird. Okay. Now he goes on. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. And then again, there's that word great. It's because of me. He's acknowledged this. He's also telling the gospel. Now notice that Jesus said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the center of the heart of the earth, Right? In the belly of that fish, then he must be three days and three nights. So Jonah is literally a type of Jesus Christ who fulfilled what Jonah does in type. So they're going to have to lay hands on him, and they're going to have to be the cause of his death, murder. Okay? And you and I do the same thing. We acknowledge that my, my sin is what was put him on the cross. Okay? The storm has come. Verse 13. However, the men rode desperately. They're not going to do that. They rode desperately to return to land, but they could not because the sea was becoming even stormier against them. Doesn't this look exactly like the apostles out on the stormy sea? It really does, doesn't it? They just rode harder. And they called upon Yahweh. Now, notice they called upon Yahweh, Israel's God, the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come. They're not calling on their gods, they're calling on the true God. Isn't that something? You see the great things happening? Great, 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 that term just occurs. Okay. By the way, the greatest miracle in the Bible is not God putting body parts back on. 
He can certainly do that. The greatest miracles in the Bible is when a dead man calls upon the living God. You understand? Lord, I got nothing. I, I've got to have you, or, or uh, because if you heal me, I'm going to die again. Anyway, it won't matter. Okay? But if I die, and you have not forgiven me in Christ, etc., I perish forever. Okay? They called upon Yahweh, these pagans, and said, We earnestly pray, O Yahweh, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. And don't put innocent blood on us, because you, O Yahweh, you've done as you have pleased. This is you do doing this or acknowledging God. You're in this storm. We see that this man is a prophet. This is true. Now, notice they didn't go, well, we really don't know how to pray. <laughs> they just figured it out, just about the time that the ship almost capsized a time or two, they figured it out how to pray, didn't they? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, we have mercy. Verse 15. So they picked up Jonah. Uh, picture yourself as Jonah. These guys finally grab you and pick you up, and they're going to throw you overboard. He's going to fulfill God's work. And notice they just acknowledge it. You're the one who's demanding this of us, and we're going to do it. So they picked up Jonah. They, thought, they think they're killing him, right? And they threw him into the sea. And the sea stopped its raging. Now again, what do you think is going through their mind now? The confirmation that this is Yahweh's doing. The storm, he brought it. Jonah, he brought him. Jonah is sinning against him. Jonah's in trouble. We're going to die because of him. And uh, then the men feared Yahweh. How much did they fear him? There's that word again, greatly. This is great. The great city, great storms, great whirlwinds, great fear, great. They feared God greatly, not a little bit. Oh my goodness, this God is not like the other gods. And they offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and made vows. My goodness. Made vows. I, what they were swearing to God, I do not know. You're the true God. We've forsaken all these other things. And Yahweh appointed a great fish. There's another great thing, all right? You can't miss this. Great, it's great, it's great. To swallow Jonah, he does. Uh, you can see the word whale where people jump to that conclusion, but it's a conclusion jump to it. It is not that word for that. It's just for a great fish, okay? To swallow Jonah. Now, the fish god is one of the gods of Nineveh. And Jonah was in the stomach for the fish three days and three nights. He's in his stomach. He's not in some whale's blowhole or something like that. All right, now, so far... Who has repented? The sailors. Chapter 2. Jonah prayed to Yahweh, the one who was, who is, and is to come, from the stomach of the fish. He said, I have called out in my distress to Yahweh, the one who was, and is, and is to come. And he answered me, I called for help from the depths of Sheol. Where is he? Sheol. If he's in Sheol, he's a dead man. So how did he live in a whale? He did not live. He said, just told you right there, I was in Sheol when I called on Yahweh. Now, my guess is, I think, as he's going unconscious and he's dying, he's saying, God have mercy. I called to God from the depths of Sheol, and you did hear my voice, because you have cast me into the deep. Now, notice, not those men. They didn't do that. You're the one who threw me into the deep, not those guys. Do you remember the brothers of Joseph when they went to Egypt? And they, he told them very frankly, he said, You know what? You sent me here. You meant it for evil. But God sent me here and meant it for good to save life, particularly your lives as well. Right? Joseph looked beyond his brothers. They were the tool that God used, but God himself is the one who did it. And God himself is doing that with you and you and you and you and me. Okay? You and I are in his hands. Can anybody get to you without him? No. No. Okay. In 2 Corinthians, he says, God puts us in trials so that we can learn to comfort others behind us with the same comfort that we received. Okay. And one of the things that we learn about our trials is sometimes they become so intense and we become depressed like Paul did and his crew. They become depressed, want to give up and think there's just no hope. And at the last second, hope comes. Okay? Israel's on the banks of the sea. Oh my goodness, the Egyptians are here. Here they come. We're all going to die. The Lord tells them, frankly, oh, shut up and go. 
Okay, why didn't he part the sea before that? That would have given them hope. You don't need hope until you until you need it, and you learn at the last moment. And after God does that enough times, you you realize that God's going to take care of me. He's going to do this. Esther, if you don't do your part, you won't survive. But make sure you understand that God will raise up deliverance from some other source. Verse 3, you did cast me into the sea, not those men, into the heart of the seas, and the current, it engulfed me or swirled around me. Your, your breakers, you know what breakers are when the water flips over, and your billows passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your side. I want you to know something. When the book opened, he was running from Yahweh. What did he just conclude? God has kicked me out. You see the difference? Do you remember 1 Corinthians? I find it fascinating. A brother is sinning. Well, God says, well, expel him. Put him out. How often do you not have to expel a man? He does it to himself. You understand? God has put him out. He has no passion. He can't make himself go to church. He can't make himself read his Bible. Next thing you know, he's drifting and drifting and drifting. And, um, you know... I, Pastor friend of mine years ago, um, he was frustrated in a community where he couldn't. He, there wasn't a good church. He, he'd been a pastor, and, and he was so frustrated with with the lack of Bible and teaching and just health. He said, "You know what? Here's the thing." He told his wife and kids, "We're going to do church. We're going to do everything at our house. We're going to do Sunday school. We're going to do all, do it all." And I remember him saying, "You know." For a couple of months, we did Sunday school, and then we did a regular service, and I would teach, and things like that. After a while, we began to skip Sunday school. We just do the worst. So, you understand where this is going? And then after a while, we'll, we'll do church later this afternoon. You understand what's going on? They're drifting. And by the time he, he began to realize and caught that and said, you know, I'm going to be in trouble here from what's going on. And uh, I remember him at the time, they're getting ready to move out of the area. And he said, you know, I wish I had joined you guys earlier and because I hadn't been to our church. And he went there and he found himself uh, I'm very pleased. Okay? I said, I've been expelled. He thought he was running from God, but no, he's been actually given the boot from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again towards your holy temple. If he's in Sheol, bottom of the ocean, how can he look there toward anything? <laughs> You understand, he's, he, these are expressions here. Now, water encompassed me to the point of death. The great uh, deep, it engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. How deep is he? He's down there. And the earth with its bars were around me forever. And you, O oh God, you brought up my life from, from where? He was in the pit. He was in Sheol. He had passed away. O oh, Yahweh, the one who was and is and is to come, my God, while I was fainting away, I remembered Yahweh, and my prayer came to you. Now notice he's praying as he is going, he realizes he's going unconscious. It's over. Lord, I'm sorry, right? And into your, my came to your holy temple. Those who regard vain idols, they forsake their own faithfulness. What a confession of his own idolatry, I think so. Mm -hmm. I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed to you, I'm going to pay. And as a prophet, he would, he would have vowed obedience. Salvation is from Yahweh. Salvation or restoration is from Yahweh. Okay. Now, so far, this... We watched the sailors repent. Now we've just watched Jonah repent. We've seen the great city, the great storm, the great wind, the great, the great, the great, right? All these great things. Verse 10, Then Yahweh commanded that fish, and it vomited up Jonah onto the dry land. <laughs> what an expression. Jonah is human vomit. Years ago, I just got out of seminary. I was teaching through Jonah. I, I taught him how to save the whale because <laughs> people were out trying to save the whales. And I said, obey the Lord. No whales will be hurt. <laughs> kind of thing in your, by your obedience here. And uh, by the way, whales do vomit on the, on the beach. Do you know when they do it? 
when they're dying. That's when they do it. Now, you'll notice a disobedient prophet makes everybody sick, makes the whales sick, and <laughs> kills them. And again, what a, what a ride that he's had. Verse 1. Now, the word of Yahweh, the one who was and is and is to come, came to Jonah the dove, the affectionate dove, the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. We're back to great things again. And proclaim it in that proclamation, which I am going to tell you. So Jonah arose, he went to Nineveh, according to the word of Yahweh, the one who was and is and is to come. You know, I keep saying that. i got to tell you, it's, a Jew reading that in Hebrew would, would know that. We don't have that in English, right? But you understand, every time he sees that name, he knows what it means. Okay? Jesus used that in Revelation chapter 1. I'm the one who was and is and is to come. I'm the Almighty. That's me. You understand, he had to use those three phrases to catch that one word, where in Hebrew it's one word. Okay? How many words, if you were in India, how many words would you have to use to explain the word hot dog to a guy in India? At least a paragraph, maybe two or three, right? Okay. Well, that's kind of what, what you do in the New Testament, but you realize, on well, the Hebrew, that's only one word. It's just that one word. Okay? Now, According, rise, he went to Nineveh according to the word of Yahweh. He's listening now. Now, Nineveh, Ishtar city, was exceedingly great. There's that word great again. Okay? A three days walk. Now, a three days walk is he's going to walk over to the crowded area and proclaim judgment, walk further and proclaim judgment, and walk further and proclaim judgment. This is a walled city, huge walls. You can ride chariots around the top. Then Jonah began to walk through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh is going to be overthrown. Literally turned upside down, overturned, like you turn a flapjack over it, your pancakes over it. And then the people of Nineveh believed in, in God, and they called a fast, and they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. What is Nineveh doing here? They're repenting. The sailors repented. Jonah's repented. Nineveh's repenting. I told you everybody in this book is going to repent. Verse 6. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne. He laid aside his robe from him, and he covered himself with sackcloth and sat on the ashes. Wouldn't you love to see the United States Senate do that? And the House and our President and Vice President and see those guys do that. And cry to God, Lord, that we're worthy of your wrath. And we've been discussing. We've been a bunch of lying frauds and scammers and forgive us. Verse 7. He used a proclamation. Now this has got some power behind it. He said, in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let a man or a beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. Now the expression here is a type because the animals are going to start crying out too, aren't they? The animals are being uh, required of this. And people say that wouldn't happen. No, it is done. We've got accounts in history of other nations doing the very same thing. But both man, and verse 8, and beast must be covered with sackcloth. Let the men call on God earnestly, that each may turn from his wicked ways and from the violence which is in his hands. These guys understood this is a wicked town, and we are wicked people, and this is a violent place. Who knows? God may turn. There's that word for repentance again. Maybe God will repent and relent and withdraw his burning anger, so that we will not perish. Now notice their guilt and shame is real enough that they understand, they know who Israel is, they know who Yahweh is, and they realize, man, we probably are in trouble. We probably are very much in trouble. And again, the sackcloth and ashes, that's accepting God's judgment before it comes, showing that you acknowledge the justice of your destruction. Now, when God saw their deeds, verse 10, that they turned from the wicked ways, then God relented. It's the same word. It's just shuv. He, he turned. The sailors turned. Jonah turned. Nineveh turned. God turned. Because the reason that God was going to judge them has just been removed. They're turning from their evil ways. 
Then God re repented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But it greatly displeased... Everything's great in this book. Jonah's displeased. How much? Greatly. He's angry. And he became... The Hebrew... I love the Hebrew. It goes, he became hot. You guys know what he's talking about. You've seen them become hotheads and just... <laughs> angry, throwing fits. and Now, that's Jonah. By the way, beginning in the first chapter, and now at the first... Is the rebellion gone out of him yet? Oh, no. Oh, no. Now, he prayed to Yahweh, the one who was and is and is to come. He said, please, Yahweh, you who were and is to come, etc. Was not this... I said this was going to happen. I'm still in my own country. You didn't send a prophet named Wrath. Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. He was hoping that they would die before he could get there. Because I knew that you're a gracious God and compassionate God. Isn't that a great line? I knew this was going to happen. These guys are evil. How, how evil? Enough God's about to take every last one of them into eternity. I knew that you'd compa have compassion on them. I knew that you'd be gracious to them. You're slow to anger. You're slow to get hot, is their word. Jonah's not slow to get hot. He's quick to get hot. Okay? And abundant in loving kindness and faithfulness is the idea of that word here. One who relents or turns concerning calamity. If this is God, why is God threatening them to destroy every last man, woman, and child? He In judgment, remember mercy, right? This is what this is about. That justice to go... If God just wanted to kill them... Would he have told any, sent a man ahead to tell him? No, but he did, because that's not what he wants. What he wants is the repentance. He wants to fix this. Okay? Same way with those soldiers, or, or excuse me, the, <coughs> the sailors on that ship. <coughs> he, God used him to bring them to faith. <coughs> and at this point in time in my life, I pray God put every last one of us on a storm and see if that's what it takes. Because we'll make excuses and say crazy things until we're crying out to God for our very lives and the lives of our families, etc. Verse 3, Therefore now, O Yahweh, the one who was and is to, is to come, take my life from me because death is better for me than life. How would you like to have Jonah as a pastor? Kill me, Lord. If you're not going to kill them, then kill me because I'm disgusted. This is a vile man. Eh? And by the way, who knows how, he, how vile the Ninevites were in their fullness of their vileness at this point in time. They're bad. God's ready to destroy them like, like Sodom and Gomorrah. And he couldn't commit suicide, but he tried to get the soldiers to kill him, and then he tried to get God to kill him. This guy's mental. Okay? You know, when I was growing up, America was considered a great land, and, our, and the evil empire was the Russians. And I became a Christian, and I realized, you know, there are Christians in Russia. Would I wish them to be killed? I don't. I don't. You know, I would pray that every Russian would come to know the Lord, and every German would come to know the Lord. I can pray with a clear conscience that Hitler came to know the Lord. I don't know that he did. I doubt he did, but, but that would be my prayer for him. Verse 4, he said to Yahweh, or Yahweh says, the one who was and is and is to come said to him, Do you have a good reason to be hot? What are you mad about? Now, Jonah went out from the city, and he sat on the east side. Now, notice, he didn't sit on the west side. That would be towards home. He's over on the east side. What's he doing? His ministry's done. Can he go home now? Oh, yeah. He, why is he not going home? I think he's still hoping out, holding out for fireworks. I'm going to watch this place just go up, and I'm going to watch everything. Maybe. What's this going to happen? Must you just kill me, guys? This guy's an emotional basket case. Okay, so he went out from the city, sat on the east side, wrong side. And he made a shelter for himself, and he sat down under in the shade. Might as well be comfortable while you're hoping for their death. Until he could see what would happen in the city. Now, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. Why are you staying there? And Yahweh, was and is and is to come, he appointed a plant... 
that grew up over Jonah and that shaded over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. He's out in the hot sun. And Jonah was exceedingly happy about that plant. Notice what he's happy about and what he's not happy about. He's just happy all oh, that plant. I'm going to just, that's a lovely plant. I really like that plant. Keep everything back. Is there any water? I'll give that thing some water and things like that. Hope he kills those people down there in that town and city. Now, verse 7, God is teaching Jonah a lesson. God appointed a worm that came in the dawn of the next day. And he uses a Hebrew word that we don't know what kind of worm this is. And it attacked the plant and it withered. It came about when the sun came up that God appointed a scorching east wind. And the sun beat down on Jonah's head, and he became faint. I'd already passed out from the heat. And he begged with all of his soul to die, saying, Death is better to me, for me than life. Now you think, why don't you get off your lazy backside and go home? What are you doing? I know there's a river there. Go get in the river. The guy is just mental. He's just weird. Verse 9, And God said to Jonah, Do you have a good reason to be angry, to be hot about that plant? He said, Yes, i got a good reason to be angry even unto death. Yes, I'm mad about that plant. You killed my plant. Now look at this. I'd be scared to talk to the Lord like that. The disrespect here is incredible. You're darn right I'm not mad. I'm, I've got a good reason to be mad. You always said to him, you had compassion on that plant. Guess what? You did not work for it. You did not cause it to grow. And it just came up overnight and it perished overnight. Well, should I not have compassion on Nineveh? Because I've worked for Nineveh. I've cultivated that thing and watched over it, right? It's a great city. And we're back to this word great everywhere here. In which there are more than 120,000 persons who don't know the difference between their left hand and their right hand as well as many animals. How bright are these people? Not very. How evil are they? Very. Has God now got their attention? Yes. And again, who's repented? Everybody. What's the word great? Great, where great's everybody, everywhere, right? This is a great thing. There's nothing greater than this. And again, don't be thrown by that word repentant. It's just a simple word. It's the Hebrew word shuv, and it means to turn. Like if God tells you turn left, you would say shuv left. Okay, just turn. It's just everybody's turning. They're turning around, right? And it is a great, great, great thing when that happens. When Jesus Christ went and took the gospel, John the Baptist said, how, how do we know for sure it's you? He said, well, the gospel is preached to the poor. He avoided the rich for the most part. He paid attention to them when they sought him out. Hey, but he didn't go to Jerusalem where all the wealth is. He's out among the uneducated, right? Can any good thing come out of, right? right? And he's in Galilee of the Gentiles. But Isaiah 8 People have sat in darkness and seen a great light, Isaiah 8 and 9. And the, and the great light, what was that? Well, Emmanuel showed up in his land. It's the land of Emmanuel. And Jesus showed up out there. They've seen a great light. These are not uh, bright city and uh, city people and, and educated, higher education. He went out there and they were told the gospel and repented. Acknowledged that they're sinful. And when they're coming out to John the Baptist, they came out and confessed their sins. Yes. Poor people have, have have that, okay? You know? Let me tell you, um, years ago, up in Council, Idaho, I was uh, doing a jail ministry up there, and uh, one of our elders was uh, was a jailer. And I would he would literally open up the jail, and I'd just walk in there with the prisoners, and he'd close it behind me. That kind of thing. And so everybody was in, in this, this um, general room, and I can't remember exactly how many people it held, but it was a good-sized crew. And I could just go and ask them about um, a Bible study. You want to join us? And they're going to hear the gospel no matter what, because we have to do it right there. And we're right in the center of all these beds that are lying around there. And people are lying around saying no. And uh, a couple of different times I can remember asking the people at the table who, who volunteered to join me if they would like to call on Christ. And every one of them said no. And there'd be a guy over there laying in his bunk and said, I do. And he'd get up and come over and join us and call on the Lord. Okay. Is the most fruitful thing I ever saw in my life because the first hurdle you got to get over, you're over it. You think these guys know they're sinners? They do. Oh, yes. And some of them, not only do they know that they're sinners, 
um, their crimes are on display. People know what they did. I think. And a guy's in there for beating his wife. That sort of thing. He's, he's totally embarrassed. Absolutely totally embarrassed. And, um, as a matter of fact, I met him because they used to bring the prisoners to our church on Sunday mornings. Sometimes in their jump shoots and things, things like that. And I asked him if he'd like to meet with me. And he said, yes. And I told him where to start. Start with uh, the Gospel of John. If you're interested in doing that, start right there and work your way through a few things. By the time I got there on Sunday, uh, uh, or later in that week, he had read through the New Testament and he was halfway through the Old Testament. And I could literally talk to him anywhere in the scriptures and he was following me just fine. And he was primed to call on the Lord because he knew he was a sinner. He knew what he'd done. And the other prisoners knew as well. Okay. Now, let me tell you something. There are people in this world, just like Jonah, we get hot about them. We don't like them. Okay. Especially if we see them as a danger to our country or our families or things like that. Okay. But somebody has to go. And Jesus charged the apostle to give their lives away. Literally, if it, if it means death, you just, you go. You don't have to like them, but you do have to be agape, genuinely concerned for them. That's what it's about. They're your enemies. Yes, they are your enemies. But be, have that agape towards them. You do that. Okay? Can great things happen? Great things happened to Jonah, and every one of them was through his rebellion. Okay? And God used him anyway. Some, I remember a preacher saying one time, if God can use Balaam's jackass, he can use you. Okay? All we need to do is be faithful. Tell people, yes, well, I'm, I'm a sinner like you. You're just like me. There's no hypocrisy. I'm, I'm probably worse than you. But God is good. And if you don't turn, if you don't repent, you will perish. It's just that simple. But the man on the cross, and thank God, do you realize what, without the, the storms and the difficulties and the struggles of this world, how many of us would have ever come to the Lord? The guy on the cross with Jesus, would he have ever called on Christ if, if he wasn't nailed to a, tr to a tree? No. He'd been out there doing what he's robbing and pillaging and murdering like he was doing before. And now he's in a desperate situation to realize, I'm about to die. And he's right next to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the Messiah, and begs for mercy. These sailors, they had their own gods because, you know, idolatry is all about all about this one thing. I love me, therefore I'm choosing this God. Because <laughs> hey, this God loves what I love, and this is what I want. And they did that. Got them out on a stormy sea. They cried like babies and called on God. And I've been such a wretch. I'm, I've lied to myself and everybody else. And, and now, would you have mercy on me? Then bring the trials on. And bring those trials however they need to be. And I think... And just as much of a trial as it takes between you and God to make you right with the Lord. Anything? I would pray the same thing for your kids and for your grandkids. Your kids are going to have to settle up with Christ. You can't settle up for them. They must call on Him. Anything? Kind of a cliche, but um, I've never used it. But it's an expression that God doesn't have any grandkids. You're, our kids must come to know the Lord and our grandkids. And if they do that, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, there's an expression they use in the medical field of, field of life over limb, that they'll take an arm off or a leg off to save your life if they can do that, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. You understand? That's what matters. That's what matters. Great things in the book. Jonah, God sent Jonah because his name carries that idea of that cooing affection that God has for them. And uh, Jonah's mad. He, he started off mad. He's ended mad. And he never... As far as I know, he, he was never at peace over this uh, kind of thing. And I have no idea how much, how long he sat there and waited and didn't, didn't go home. And I would look and think, you're a spoiled brat, man. You know, God should probably paddle you and kind of thing because that's how you're behaving. Well, thank you for our, our reading this evening. How many great things are in this book? They're incredible. It is a book about great things. And the greatest thing of all is everybody's turning. And everybody's turning to you. And you in, in life turned away from their destruction. And if, the, if we turn to the one who is going to destroy us in hope of mercy and find it. I love and praise you, Lord God. Thank you. May we find it in our hearts for those around us who even are our enemies, they're not good neighbors, or they're just are, are, um, they're troubling us. 
uh, we don't have to like them. That's not possible. But we can certainly have genuine agape concern for them. This is the love that you offer. May we express that in every way. In your name we pray. Amen.